And now we'll look at the Siege of Valeria campaign expansion. We'd like to thank Daily Magic Games for providing us both the core game and its expansion to review. The Siege of Valeria campaign expansion and Siege of Valeria itself was designed by friend of the show, Glenn Flaherty, who we know through his Board Games and Bourbon YouTube channel, which I encourage you to check out. It features artwork from who else but the Miko, and as Sean mentioned, was published by Daily Magic Games, coming out last year after a successful Kickstarter for three different small box Valeria games. We reviewed all three of those games. If you care to check them out, look for reviews of Thrones of Valeria, Dice Kingdoms of Valeria, and the winter expansion for it, and of course, Siege of Valeria, on the blog, YouTube, and past podcast episodes. Now, the campaign expansion for Siege of Valeria keeps the single-player count, but significantly increases the game time, as it requires you to play three rounds of the game to complete a full campaign. The setup and takedown times are also increased as it is the time spent between games getting the decks all reset up and between the rounds. The overall game weight also increases a bit as there's quite a bit more to think about when playing a campaign. Now the campaign expansion for Siege of Valeria continues the story from the base game. The Queen of Valeria is impressed with your ability to defend the southern border and has put you in charge of defending the entire kingdom. This is played out through a series of three sieges where your results in one battle will affect the next battle as well as contributing to an overall score. Other new elements include powerful bosses to defeat, elite troops, enemy commanders, dukes who help you defend the walls, and more. Now for a look at all this new stuff, be sure to check out our Siege of Valeria campaign unboxing on YouTube. There you'll see just how much stuff they managed to stuff into this pretty small box. There's a lot of new stuff here. You've got new Siege Engine cards, a deck full of new bosses to face, a deck of elite troops, enemy commander and duke decks, new champions, new events, penalty and bonus decks, a replacement reference card, and a surprisingly thick rule book that unfortunately comes folded in half in order for it to fit in the book. Speaking of rules, let's move on to an overview of how to use this Siege of Valeria expansion. So the big thing this expansion does is turns what was a single game, solitaire game, into a three game series where the results from each game contribute to a total score and how you do in one game does affect the next. So it's still solitaire, just longer solitaire. Yep. Now, nothing wrong with that, but make sure you're not thinking it's added anything in the way of player count, co-op or anything like that. Now, this expansion also adds quite a few new things, which makes setting up a bit fiddly. Before the first game, you're going to add new cards to your existing cards. That's new champions, events, and siege engines. You just mix these in. Note, they forgot to tell you that in the rule book, but it's pretty obvious. You then set up the game as normal with a few exceptions, like you're going to mix in one boss monster into the bottom of the siege deck, and you're going to add four elite troops to the troop deck. Next, you find out who you're facing in the first battle by drawing a commander and find out who's helping you by drawing a duke. While using this expansion, you get three starter champions, which you place into your towers now. Normally, when you're playing the main game, you have to earn champions. You start with three. Now, these are pretty powerful champions, but they have one-time use abilities. So once they're used, they're put into the bottom of the deck, but not discarded. Note, if you added the new siege engines to the deck, you need to remove seven at the start of the game, not five. This was missed in the rulebook and clarified by the designer on Board Game Geek which would be why my first game was ridiculously hard the first time and felt impossible. Make sure you do that one. Note the two new siege are actually there so you can swap them out for existing ones or put them in. It's up to your choice. At this point, you play Siege of Valeria with a couple extra phases. So after you roll the dice, the enemy commander power goes off. These include nasty things like putting a flame token on a tower of your choice or causing you to discard champion cards. And for those of you not familiar with the base game, that's bad. If you lose a champion or get four flame tokens on one location, that's it. Game over. Now, during the siege engine phase, if the boss is out, it attacks. Each boss has two different attacks, and they're both super nasty. Note that while the boss does activate during the siege engine phase, they aren't considered siege engines for all the other rule purposes. So that does that impact how the bosses move and when they can be hit similar to siege engines, or is it just in the timing? So bosses don't have range ratings like siege engines and move up just as troops do. When the troops in front of them are defeated, they move up at the end of the round. Now they attack every round at whatever range they happen to be at. 
uh, during the siege engine phase, which technically is now called the siege engine and boss phase. So basically, they're just an extra troop type that activates at the same time as the siege engines. Now, at some point in here, your duke's power may go off. Remember, you got a random duke at the start of the game, and different dukes affect different phases of the game. So, for example, one duke has you draw two event cards during the event phase and pick which one to happen. It's a good thing, because most of the events are nasty. Another has you roll up one of your red dice during the roll dice phase. The main action phase stays the same except for the rules for elite troops and bosses. Elite troops each have two battle numbers on them with a bar under them. This is to remind you that you need to spend dice showing these exact numbers in order to defeat them. Now, as noted earlier, bosses have two attacks. Well, the way it's listed is each attack has its own battle numbers, like defense values or health or whatever you want to call it. And all both of these are going to require strength and magic to, to defeat them, to beat them. So if you spend enough to defeat one of these attacks, you disable it and you get to market. There's a new damage token and you put it on top of the card to remind you when it gets to the next uh, siege and boss phase, they won't use that attack. Once you take out the second attack on a boss, that does take it out. So far in all the games I've played, there has never been a chance where I could take out both. They just required too many dice, too high a numbers to take out both in one round. If you pulled this off, congratulations. I haven't done it yet. Now, bosses, when you defeat them, unlike siege engines, again, remember, they're not siege engines. You don't get anything. But they are worth points at the end of the game, even if you lose. So you're playing three games regardless of losing any of the individual games then? That's correct. Uh, the in individual win and loss conditions don't change in the game. You need to defeat all the siege engines to win, lose if you run out of enemy troops or one of your towers fall or a siege engine reaches your wall, but you are playing three games either way. Now, once you finish a game, you calculate your score, which is one point for defeating the boss and bonus points for surviving the game based on what game number it is. One point for surviving one, three for game three. Now, once you're done, you set up the next round, assuming it's not the third one. If you won, you're going to draw a new boss and enemy commander. You defeated those ones, right? Makes sense. You then get to draw a card from the bonus deck, which will be a one-time use card that you can use in your next battle. Uh, one of the ones I got to see, because I didn't win a lot of these, was shuffle through the enemy troop deck and draw two cards and add it to your hand. Now, if you do defeat the boss but lose the battle, you're still going to face the same commander. They defeated you, but you will need to draw a new boss. And, well, you're going to have to draw a new duke because you lost and your duke died. You also then have to draw a penalty card. This happens right at the start of the game in the first round after you roll your dice and includes some form of penalty. Uh, when I first played, one of my red troops, my red dice ran away, deserted me. Great, thanks. If you fail completely, you replace your duke, face the same boss, face the same commander, and have to deal with a penalty card. Now, the fascinating part here is, of course, the fact that losing one battle doesn't mean you've lost the war. Well, yes, a perfect score at the end, where you win every battle and defeat every boss, does make you the hero of Valeria, and they throw holidays in your name. They name, name, name a holiday after you. You only actually need six points for the second best result, and even a result of three points is a partial victory. So what did you think of campaign? I know we both liked, but didn't love Siege of Valeria. Does this improve it? Yeah, most definitely. Uh, the new elements here of elite troops, bosses, starting champions, enemy commanders, and dukes bring Siege of Valeria to another level, another complexity level, and honestly, interest level. It's just more going on and more interesting things going on and more things to think about and ways to make combos. Well, that's certainly welcome, in large part because neither of us are solo gamers. I think there wasn't enough of a game there in the base set for us to want yeah. to take the trouble of setting it up and playing. Having a bit more game to the game changes that calculation. Yeah, there is a ton of stuff here. Like, you only use one boss per fight. Uh, technically, you might use the same boss three times if you play badly enough, but you get seven in the box. You're only mixing in four elite troops each game, but the campaign box comes with 16. There are 10 different enemy commanders. There are 10 different dukes. You also got new events and new champions that just get tossed in the mix. All of this helps make the game more variable. While I found the original game starts to feel repetitive, especially if you play a bunch of games in a row, like three, that's relieved a lot with this expansion. 
Indeed, a definitely an increase in replayability, even though you're now playing three games at a time instead of just one. Now, that said, the basic gameplay is the same. It, this is still Siege of Valyria. It still feels like Siege of Valyria. This is still a puzzle game in the end where you're trying to figure out the best use of your dice and cards every round and doing your best to set up combos that let you take out multiple troops or siege engines in one round. As we mentioned earlier, it's still a solitaire game, if longer one than previously. And that length is my biggest concern with this expansion. It turns what was a half-hour game into a two-hour game, if you play through all campaign games in one sitting. The additional setup and teardown required before, after, and between rounds is significant. You are having to sort all the decks out every time and rebuild them and reshuffle them. As one example, the troop deck. Start of the game, you're going to have to separate all the elite cards from the normal cards because they probably mixed in from the last game unless when you cleaned up you did this. You're then going to shuffle both those decks, the troop deck and the elite troop deck. You're going to take two cards off the standard deck, remove them from the game, put them back in the box. You're then going to deal your two self two cards as your starting hand. Then you're going to lay out the grid, the, the four by five grid, 20 cards out on the table. Then you're going to take the deck and remove four more cards from the game and put them in the box. Then you're going to draw four cards from the other deck, the elite deck. Then you're going to shuffle those in to the basic deck. Like that's all the steps just to prepare one of the decks in the game. Prepping the siege deck is similar. And even like just finding the three starter champions and recognizing the one logo on them takes some time. Just all of this is a lot more fiddly prep work. Yeah, the setup does sound a bit onerous. Though I expect it's similar to what a lot of solo players need to do for games. So not totally out of line if that is your preferred gaming experience. Yeah, fair enough. I haven't really played enough different solo games myself to really compare the amount of setup time. Uh, most of my solo experience are simple card games like Friday or Ona Rim. So compared to those, there's a lot of work. Now, my other complaint about Siege of Valeria campaign is, is one you've probably heard me mention on the show now multiple times of miss expectations to a little bit. Because when I heard campaign, I thought RPG campaign. I thought story. I thought ongoing, evolving story. What they mean by Siege of Valeria campaign is military campaign. You are playing through a three battle military campaign and not an RPG style campaign. Yes, there is some background info and yeah, the, the, the different end game scores give you a little story. You know, you get to have a holiday named after you, but it's no more than you'd expect in any board game. This is in no way adding any RPG stuff. Though uh, we've reviewed other games as well that if not solo are still single game experiences with campaigns that just change the setup some and involve playing it multiple times with very little story other than a light paste on. I think it's something that many games are trying to capitalize on, but as shown here, can perhaps fail if expectations aren't set well. Overall, I was really impressed by how much Siege of Valeria was improved by adding the campaign expansion. I can't really see playing Siege without it going forward. Now, the one thing I think people may want to do, which isn't mentioned in the book at all, but I think should be, is to use all of this stuff to just play a single game. Draw a boss, draw a commander, give yourself a duke, shuffle in some elite troops, toss in a boss, and just play. Certainly no reason why you can't add it all in now that you've got it. If you own Siege of Valeria and enjoy it at all, you really should pick up the campaign expansion. It really does improve the base game and needs to be added to our growing list of must-have board game expansions. Now, if you were like Sean and I and thought Siege of Valeria was good, but not something we could see ourselves playing all that often, you might want to pick this expansion up. I can definitely see myself playing more campaigns in the future. That being said, it's still a solo game, and some people prefer the social aspects of gaming. This certainly isn't going to open the game up to those people. In the end, Siege of Valeria is still Siege of Valeria, even with the campaign expansion. And if mathy puzzles are not what you want out of a fantasy siege game, this expansion isn't going to win you over. Despite the name, it doesn't add any story or RPG elements to this solo dice and card game. Well, that's it for our look at the Siege of Valeria campaign expansion. Are there any games who've expanded from single adventure to campaign that you enjoy? Comment and tell us all about it below. Now, I gave a pretty high level overview of play here. If you want more details on exactly how the campaign expansion 
Procedure of Valeria works and the actual setup involved for each game step by step, please check out my written review over at the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. Finally, if you enjoyed this review, please consider tipping your bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop.